Yes, well, comedy, comedy changes over the years, doesn't it? I mean, the style of comedy changes. I remember doing a double act with Stanley Baxter in Singapore on the stage, who was just a kilted Scotsman, and he had to say, All into the so honest, the so honest in Cairo. I hung a watch on a lamppost there in 1940. And when I went back in 1946, I was still there. And I was supposed to say, what, the watch? And he had to say, the lamppost. And on the night, I actually said, what, the lamppost? And he said, no, the watch. <laughs> you stupid great Jesse! <laughs> Furious. But no such contretemps occur with my next guest, or at least I don't think so. You'll have seen him in Black Adder, and he'll be appearing in Comic Relief on BBC One this Friday. He wrote the new production of Me and My Girl. He writes as entertainingly as he performs. He's only 28. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Fry. Well, we've just got used to seeing your face, and they tell me you're off to America. Yes, that's right. There's production of Me and My Girl opening in... Uh... New York later this summer, so I'm going to watch the rehearsals. And everything. You're going over to America. Will you be terribly, terribly English? Well, I think you've got to be really they enjoy it, you know. They like that's why I'm wearing these tweeds. I'm trying to wear them in, you know, <laughs> so that they can stop you in the street and admire your accent and things. Yeah. Did, and you went to Australia with it, the show as well? Yes, it opened in Australia over Christmas. Uh, I went out to Australia in about December. I've been there before, in fact, um, and I was faintly worried how it would go. But in fact, it's gone extremely well. It's been on in Sydney and it's now on in Melbourne. And they, they seem to like it. I don't know why. Did you find the... Um, is it a, a very different reaction to humour in Australia? Well, it's a very peculiar place. I mean, you've probably been there lots of times, but uh, as I say, I've been there twice. The most extraordinary thing, when I first arrived, I turned on the television to see the um, commercials. And uh, there was a man squatting on the ground. And he suddenly went... <laughs> like this. And said, I've gone completely mad! And uh, I thought, is this an investment or a comedy show? He said, yeah, I've gone crazy. I'm crazy Eddie. I'm giving money away. And he then started bouncing around these used cars, jumping on the roofs, throwing dollars in the air. And that's, uh, that's a used car salesman doing the dirt. <laughs> I mean, it makes Bernard Matthews look rather plain, doesn't it? <laughs> but um, it really, it's, it's like that. I mean, they are extraordinary, but very, very, I mean, most of them are originally British in some way or another. Yes, I, I love when you started that. I thought squatting. I thought it was all going to be rather rude, you know. You would like that, wouldn't you? Do a thing about squatting in the outback. I used to do a thing about that. Now you started off with Cambridge Footlights, and you must have found a lot of material there. I should think eccentricities with those old dons. And yes, with well, the, the old dons and the new dons. I mean, there were some extraordinary ones. I, I was taught by a man. Um, you have these things called supervisions, where you go and read an, an essay at them, and they comment on it and set you another essay for the next week. And there was a man who used to lie down on a chaise long when he read his essay, sometimes put his ha a handkerchief over his head, and his eyes would close, and he would conduct as he read, like that, as if, as if he was sort of conducting <laughs> his sentence. And writing an essay means really going to a library and copying down great chunks out of a book. And um, I, I was reading this essay, and it seemed to be going very well, because he was going, mm, yes, mm, yes. And then his hand went up like that, and it went backwards, and he turned on his radio. And I carried on reading this essay, this radio blaring out a bit of Mozart and things like this. And I was carrying on, and he was listening like that. And then the, the handkerchief began to go up and down like that. And I'd sent him to sleep with my little essay. So I had to wake him up by coughing. Charming, uh, charming. But, in fact, I mean, some of the most extraordinary things, as a porter, a splendid porter, I think he's since been gathered to God, but he was a wonderful figure, um, called Jaggers. And he once, um, he used to know everybody's name in the entire university, really all 10,000. And he once... Um, he once crept up a staircase at about three in the morning, hearing the noise of an extraordinary party going on. And he crept up and he opened the door, and inside were about 12 male undergraduates, completely naked. And he <laughs> said, oh, I'm terribly sorry, sir, so I thought there were some women here. And he closed the door and went <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it is a somewhat unusual place. Yeah. Uh, there also, I mean, there are also the modern dons, you see, I mean, are, are very extraordinary. There was one man who I, I shan't name, who was very, very earnest. He was what was called a structuralist. And, uh, he used to do this, this course of lectures on sexual difference. I'm allowed to say the word difference, yeah. And uh, he, uh, he, you know, they lasted two hours because he thought one hour was rather oppressive for, for a lecture. It was too short. And uh, 
he, on the last one, he said, uh, uh, we're not going to have a cigarette break, if that's all right with you, uh, for this lecture. Uh, we'll just carry on through the two hours. And he then got out these boxes in which were the most extraordinary pornography you could ever imagine. I mean, outrageous. Every animal, every type of plant, every age, every gender you could possibly conceive of was represented in these lurid pages. Unbelievable. And um, he, he said, uh, Jeff, would you like to hand these out? And they were handed out as if they were poems for analysis. And he said, so, uh, Mike, thoughts? And all these people kind of going... <laughs> All the jargon of English literature had just flown out of their heads and they could just turn them. So, yes, very peculiar people. <laughs> now, you've been making a big feature film, haven't you? Uh, well, I, I don't know if big is the right word. I've been making a film. I mean, I, I've been making a film. Uh, I've been in a film. Uh, it's called The Good Father. And I, it's got Anthony Hopkins as, as, as the lead. And I, I did three scenes with him, which was very exciting. Uh, Are you indulging in method acting in Method? <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not exactly a method actor. Uh, I used to, used to play kings in Shakespeare as the furthest I got with really serious acting, uh, which is occasionally a good thing to do, especially here on Shakespeare's birthday. I want to give them the old fellow a plug. But uh, method, do you know, there's an extraordinary story about, um, about Gielgud in, in New York when he was, um, he was in a play, and it was being directed by a very method director. And instead of rehearsing what they were doing, they were, they were kind of um, feeling each other, physically and mentally. And at one point, the director said, I think it would be a good idea if we all came down and I want you to say the thing that is most disgusting that you can remember, the most revolting, obscene thing you can think of. And this woman came down and said, um, eating my own abortion, and something like that, and then wandered off. And then somebody else came on and said, running over my mother in a car crash. And he was saying, good, this is working. John, would you like to come down? And John Gielgud came down, had been disapproving of this style of rehearsal for a long time, and said, now what, John, is the most revolting, obscene thing you can think of? And he said, we open in three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a, mm. But I gather, you, you know, I mean, method acting, I mean, I can't, I can't dismiss it. There have been some great method actors, but it's not for the likes of us, is it? Well, they told Spencer Tracy it would be very useful to him. They said you ought to go down to see Lee Strasberg. It's one of the studio or the method. It would really, you know, help you. And Tracy allegedly replied, I'm too old, I'm too tired, and I'm too talented to care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you know the famous story about Dustin Hoffman and Laurence Olivier? And, and you know they made the Marathon Man. Together. Oh, yes. A wonderful film. And uh, one day on set, up came Dustin Hoffman, unshaven, completely bleary-eyed, looking absolutely appalling. And Olivier said, my dear fellow, what's the matter? And he said, uh, well, the scene I've got to play, uh, the character has not slept for two nights. So I'm, you know, I'm doing it. I haven't slept for two nights. So it can be real, you know? And he wandered around the set, falling asleep. And Olivia said, oh, my dear fellow, you should try acting. It's so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we've got time for. Well, a great success in America. Thank, thank you very, you much. very much, Stephen. <laughs>Of course, you must have noticed the roses. Yes, no expense spared on this show. I thought they were for me, but no, they said someone far greater than you. St. George's Day today. The rose, symbol of St. George, patron saint of England. I wouldn't know anything about it. I'm not English, I'm Welsh. Mazenbach, Cymru, Cymru Seed, Cymru Vydd, Cymru and Biff. Very poetic, isn't it? Mm. And appropriate, because the Bard's birthday too. William Shakespeare's birthday today. Things you'd learn on this show. Pretty documentary, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and Shakespeare said, if music be the food of love, play on.